maybe you could take us through using all your training and education and, and uh, experience with all your, your clients. Um, walk us through what, what does the decision-making process look like in what, you know, when you're dealing with uncertainty and, and again, in especially relevant now, given the fact that we are still in the middle of a crazy and, and, uh, unprecedented time that has created a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Yeah, that's a good process is a good word here. I tend to use the word framework, but we did use a framework in the SEAL teams, um, you know, because people tend to think, well, because you're Navy SEALs, you went into all these uncertain environments, obviously you've got some kind of magic formula. Well, well, we, we do, we borrowed that magic formula from you, from humankind. It's a framework that we all use again every day, even when we're thinking about making dinner or whatever that we're getting married, right? We start with trying to make, we start with a stimulus, right? Something happens or you're going to go on a mission. Then we start trying to make sense of it. And that's the first part. Well, um, you know, we, and we typically will, will make sense of things by telling ourselves and each other a story. And then we start adding bits and pieces of that story together uh, to come up with something that's plausible anyway doesn't necessarily have to be accurate. After that, sense making, then we go exploring, right? We start weighing our different options, different alternatives and stuff like that. Uh, and then we go into uh, the, that next part of that framework is experimenting. We'll go try some things out, you know, uh, we'll, we'll add a pinch of salt here and there, so to speak. And then last but not least is we adjust. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna the world gives you feedback, whether you like it or not. Um, and from that feedback, we make those adjustments. And that framework of make sense, explore, experiment, adjust has been around for at least 50,000 years. Ever, you know, whenever, ever since language developed, right? That is kind of the way we make sense of uncertain situations. We try and figure out what's going on. We explore some of the options we have. We conduct some experiments. Uh, and then from the feedback, we make adjustments a little bit left and right. So it's, it's effective. It works. Yeah, you know, it's I, as you were speaking, I was re reminded you. You know, you, you use the example of um, you know making what what are we going to have for dinner? And my wife and I do that all the time, right? During right. you know, we, we every once in a while we say to ourselves, all right, we're going to plan the entire week out so we can go, you know, do all the shopping ahead of time, and we don't have to think about it, and we can make sure we have all the and invariably that completely falls apart immediately. And the next thing you know, it's like, all right, it's four o'clock. What are we doing for dinner in, you know, two or three hours? And, and, um, and then you make that decision, right? Whether you're just too tired to cook or you want to just get Chinese or, um, or if you're going to actually go to the effort of, of putting something together. But I'm all, I, I thought about as you were speaking, um, Steve Jobs, uh, who obviously very successful guy who uh, has impacted all of our lives. And one of the things he would do, as I'm sure you're well aware, is he wore the same exact thing every day, right? He right. wore that black, I think black turtleneck or mock turtleneck and jeans or pants or whatever, black pants every single day. And the reason he said he did that is because he didn't want to have to make a decision about it in the morning. He felt that not, you know, bypassing that as a decision got him started on the right, you know, on the right frame of mind. And it sounds like he just want, you know, knows he has so many million decisions to make every day. The last thing he wanted to do was have to make a decision about what he was going to wear and coordinating an outfit. Maybe it was just colorblind. I always thought maybe that was just the case and he didn't want to put something together that didn't look right. But, uh, but he claimed it was because he didn't want to have to make that decision each morning. So great point. So in, in that framework, so we can get better at all those steps, right? When you talk about making sense, that's really about coming to understand bias uh, explorations. There's, there's ways we can go about reframing. Is it possible that? That's a great question to ask ourselves. Uh, experimenting is, you know, that, that is where we, we actively manage risk when we get out there and, and start trying some things out. That's where we really experience the threat of losing something, um, which holds people back, right? And it, you know, helps to link arms and go into that uncertain environment together. Uh, and then the adjustment piece, the feedback piece, you know, those are things, again, that's a place that holds us back because we don't like feedback so much. So we get better at each one, every one of those steps. One of the things we can do is what Steve Jobs did is we recognize that that kind of conscious decision making takes a great deal of energy and that energy is finite. So if, you know, this is, again, a classic to me is if you show up in front of a, uh, a judge, God forbid you, you broke the law, you got to, you know, go to court. 
When should you go in front of that judge? 10 o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the afternoon? Most of us are gonna say, huh, we're making sense of this, right? Probably in the morning. Why? Because we're rested in the morning, we ate breakfast, we have energy. The judge is more apt to uh, see shades of gray as opposed to four o'clock when he or she is out of energy uh, and they're gonna see things as black or white, right? You were speeding, therefore you're guilty. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Jobs recognize that, right? We have to, so those routines, anything that we can set aside to routine is great. Those are the things that happen, this is checklist stuff. The things that happen uh, every day at the same time or every year at the same time or the, or the context repeats itself. I tell people, I go mountain biking. Every time I go, I have a checklist, right? I got my helmet and gloves, I got my shoes and socks, I have my GPS and my heart rate monitor, and I have my bike done. I don't need to think about it. Uh, this, the next piece is, uh, you know, once you start to make sense of something and you get into, this really gets into uh, uh, the exploration phase, right? Now we start asking ourselves questions about things like uh, timing. Is it possible that I don't have to make this decision right now. That's key. Right. Right? And one of those, then it's not routine. So is it possible that I don't have to make this decision right now? And if we answer yes to that question, there are very few crises, real crises in the world. You can set that aside and give it to your subconscious, right? So your, your conscious mind is can direct that energy elsewhere. Subconscious loves to chew on things like this. And you'll also be more... Uh, you'll be less inclined to rely on biases. So we ask ourselves, we've got an important decision to make, we're gonna make a decision about dinner, it's uncertain. Is it possible that I don't have to make that decision until later? Let the subconscious think about it uh, and, and conserve that much needed finite energy for things that matter right now. Did you find that making decisions, uh, so yeah, what you're talking about again is the energy that it takes to make a decision. And it's true, especially if it's a more difficult decision. So did you find that in, in your days in this, as a SEAL uh, that because you were making so many literally life and death decisions when you were doing your missions, right? And, and I'm sure not every one of them were life or death, I assume. That's a good question. What percentage of missions that, you know, we all think of all these missions because we see the movies of every one of them being life or death, you know, where you're always at, at grave risk. What percentage of missions that you would run were actually ones where you where people were actually in grave danger? Was it was it a high, high percentage or is it actually a low percentage? I mean, are, are there were many that were sort of routine where, you know, you were just going out to do something and, you know, you knew it wasn't a big, you still had to execute well, but it wasn't sort of life or death or grave danger was involved. So every one of those missions was generally great uncertainty. There are some routine aspects of conducting a raid. Take the Bin Laden raid, right? It's a raid. So we know that we're going to have to insert somewhere. We know we're going to have to patrol to the target. We know we're going to have to assault the target. We know we're going to have to leave, right? So those patterns are always the same. What happens in each one of those phases is not something you can ever predict. Um, you know, one of the worst ambushes I was ever in was, you know, uh, something obviously we never that's why it's called an ambush we never saw it coming and um you know so the 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 risk to life can go up just like that and that's this you know nature of uncertainty and you know it, that's why we you know plan and prepare but we also recognize that um the planning or the plan as it stands is not something that's gonna you know survive first contact, right? Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> um, and that's something we need to remember, right? Everybody has a plan. Great to do that. Most of our planning, um, the, the benefit from planning is sitting down together and talking about things. What are you doing when you're doing that? You're making sense, right? So we're at the first stage of that. But then we have to remember, right, that we're going to get some feedback. We've got to be open to that feedback. That's the adjust phase, you know, uh, and we're going to have to move left or right. Some of that stuff we can fall back on rote drills, right? So when we got ambushed, you know, we initially know that we have to drop down towards our field of fire, right? To find out where the bullets are coming from. Then we start making decisions rapidly with the tools that we have and that we have practiced. All that is good stuff, but there are going to be elements in there where, again, you make a decision, you don't know how it's going to turn out. And uh, as I said, 
Look at the helicopters on the Bin Laden raid, right? That decision was made, forced on us to use those helicopters. We didn't know how it was gonna turn out, but we suspected it wasn't going to turn out well. We had a plan not to, not to stop the helicopters from crashing, but a plan to deal with failure when it happened, right? And once we get that feedback, we're not tied to our plan. We're flexible. We let it go. Again, you know, ego will keep you from uh, saying, you know, hey, I, I think we've made a mistake here. We need to change directions, right? There's some, some cost fallacies and stuff like that apply as well. Um, yeah, so all those things apply. And, but again, they're all part of that framework. You're making sense rapidly. When you get good at answering, answering these questions, you can do this incredibly rapidly. You make it sense rapidly. You get into that exploratory phase where is it possible that uh, this decision is not going to have any impact on me tomorrow. Is it possible that, as I said earlier, uh, I can set this decision aside for an hour? Is it possible that we're going to fail, right? And then we explore those avenues. Then we get out there, we do the test, and we can be doing this in real time, as say, in an, in an ambush. Uh, or is it possible that the helicopters will go down? Sure is. What are we going to do? Well, we can put some steps in place to try and prevent that or preclude it. But we, when we do, that's fine. We should do that. But we all, what we forget then is that failure is a real option. So what are you going to do when you fail? Uh, that's another key question to ask as well. Uh, you know, is it possible that ethics is another one that we would weigh into this? Is it possible that we are concentrating too much on the ends and not enough on the means, right? So that's the ethics of consequentialism. Is it possible that... Um, we're concentrating too much on our own well-being and forgetting everybody else's. That's the, the ethics of, uh, of um, uh, utilitarianism. Is it possible that we stepped over a line that we said we'd never cross? So deontological ethics. Those things all come in in that, in that framework of exploring. And then you got to do. And then you got to get the feedback and you got to adjust. It's that simple. So going back to the Bin Laden rate, because again, you and I have talked about it quite a bit as 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 many are aware, and as you certainly have told me, uh, and you just said it, that the, the helicopters, that decision was taken out of the equation because it was made for you, right? You, you were told that you were going to use these particular helicopters. And even though you weren't at all happy about that decision, that decision was made for you. You didn't have to make that decision. So the next step was to, um, as, you, as you've told me before, prepare, right? Over and over right. for the not even the possibility, but the likelihood that one of those, because there were two two involved, correct? Two helicopters involved, right? There was a likelihood that at least one of them wasn't going to going to um, make it back, right? That it was going to fail. And why don't you tell us what happened a little bit? So, I mean, many people have seen the movie, but you were yeah. you were directly there. What 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 happened? Yeah, so what happened was when I was brought into the very early on, brought into the planning. I was told at uh, you know CIA headquarters, hey, you're going to be using these super secret stealth helicopters that I had I'd never even heard of in my life. You know, like, okay, we've been at war for a decade. Where were these helicopters? So instantly, and this is special operations 101 stuff, the time to try something new. Experimentation is great. You have to experiment. You have to innovate. But the time to try something new is not on the most important raid since World War II, right? You need things that are tried and tested. Our regular helicopters, are, you know, were, were workhorses. They had, uh, you know, they were just, as I said, they were workhorses. We didn't need anything uh, newfangled and fancy. And certainly something that didn't have any, um, you know, testing behind it. So I said, hey, with all due respect, I wouldn't use these helicopters. You know, and this is, uh, you know, this is an ego battle right here. The person I said that to was, was the person who had come up with that plan on his own, uh, the senior military commander. And, and he was offended that I would speak my mind, you know. As a guy with you know a decade of combat experience at that point, how dare you? Your operator at the most elite SEAL team we have would speak his mind. But anyway, we, that was forced on us. But and so what happened was, you know, I recognized, and so did a few others, that you know your weakest link is your weakest link, right? It sounds uh, like an oxymoron, but it's absolutely true. And that helicopter was our weakest link. Now, we could ignore it. That'd be an optimism bias. Bad things only happen to other people. This is part of the sense-making phase, right? We didn't do that. We said, okay, there's a possibility that this thing is going to crash. If it crashes in flight at 160 knots when you're 500 feet off the ground, not a lot we can do right there. But right. if it crashes in a hover where it was unstable, 
Well, now there are some things we can do there. What can the pilots do? Well, they can practice controlled crash landings. Landings, that's what they did over and over and over again. Really in the two weeks that we had to, to practice or rehearse for this mission. What else can we do if we fail? Um, and this gets into, again, the exploratory part. Uh, is it possible that the helicopter crashes and we fail? What else can we do? Well, we can, we can destroy the helicopter so that nobody gets their hands on it and gets that technology. And that's what the operators did. It's a plan that they came up with, not me, and they destroyed that helicopter on the ground there. And I think it's the backup standing by because you, you need help getting out of there. Yeah, our regular helicopters were the backup that were standing by. That it's interesting, right? Because why would you need stealth helicopters? It's not like I would imagine that Bin Laden and his crew had a lot of you know high-tech capability to see these you know things. Pakistan were the ones that we were worried about, but Who? our helicopters, the Pakistan military, okay. but we our helicopters could defeat their radar, right? Okay. Many, so in fact, one of them failed, right? One of them crashed. One of them crashed. You know, the guys didn't slow the guys down at all because they were prepared for it, because the pilots were prepared for it. The pilot crash landed that helicopter quite nicely. This, uh, you know, a couple guys got some bruises and bumps and stuff like that, but it really didn't slow them down at all. Um, and then you blew the thing up. Blew the thing up and, and left on our, our regular helicopters. Mm -hmm. our old helicopters. But it highlights a couple things in there, and this gets into the sense-making phase. One of those things is an outcome bias. And I ask people all the time, uh, we have this, we focus on results, results, results. Um, we are fixated on results, right? But we forget when it comes to decision-making to ask ourselves, uh, not necessarily what happened, but what information did we have at the time we made the decision, right? So an outcome bias, you forget about that. We, no one has perfect information, but if you fail, or even if you succeed, let's just say you fail. Somebody fails, we instantly want to point the finger at them, right? We want to cut them off at the knees. What we should do instead is say, well, what information did you have at the time you made that decision, right? That's key to overcoming that bias. Even if we're successful, uh, we sometimes can get lucky. So I, I say this to people all the time. If one of those helicopters had not crashed on the Bin Laden raid, uh, would it still have been a good idea to use them? And the answer is absolutely not. Sometimes you get lucky. All of the data, right, that we were receiving feedback wise suggested that we should not use those helicopters. They were unstable. They had never been tried and tested, right? So if you, sometimes you get lucky, right? Your, your competitor does something foolish, not because you did something well, your competitor messes up, or the environment doesn't rear up and bite you as it could. You know, you got lucky. So if you don't go back and say, what information did we have at the time, you're likely to continue relying on your good luck. And ultimately, that's going to come back and bite you in the butt, um, mm -hmm. which happens quite a bit. And again, that's part of the sense making phase, understanding those biases. You and the biases, you mentioned that there's an optimism bias, right? But there's also you can either have a person who is optim uh, biased toward the, um, the, the being an optimist or biased towards being a pessimist, right? I would assume there are people on both sides. Is there one that is more successful than others? I just, well, let me interrupt. I'm going to answer the question a little bit first, which is that I just read an article and I don't remember where it was, but it was somewhere on my newsfeed, which is another thing I want to talk about. But they talked about how, you know, people who are optimistic by nature live longer and that they are uh, more successful. So, um, but you also do have to be careful about that optimism bias, right? Because as you said, if you had just looked at that raid, the Bin Laden raid and said, you know what, I'm sure that, I'm sure those, th those helicopters will work out just fine. Let's not worry about them. Let's focus on the rest of it. You would have had a real problem. So one thing we all have to do is take a step back, right? And try and look at it with, um, you know, an objective view. Uh, and 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 make sure that we're making the decisions, recognizing our own biases, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and that's an awareness level. So, uh, which is key to making good decisions in a, in an uncertain environment. Over time, you'll develop a, a level of awareness, and that particular awareness is a, is an awareness of biases. Right? There's a bazillion studied biases out there. There are a few that really hamper us when it comes to making decisions. I mentioned the optimism bias. You can be the pessimist, right? Um, not necessarily a bad thing, right? Skepticism as a method is a good thing that comes in during that, that uh, sense-making phase, right? Or that exploratory uh, uh, 
uh, phase, right? Where we are skeptical. We also have to recognize that when it gets to bias, that we are incredibly sensitive to negative information in the environment, right? So that leads us towards being pessimists instead of being optimists, right? So if you become aware of that, I can use skepticism as a method, but I can also see, uh, you know, be an optimist as well. What we want to watch out for when it comes to optimism is the optimism bias. And that is that bad things only happen to other people, they don't happen to me. That's not a good uh, way to be optimistic, right? You're the person who is not going to live a long and satisfi satisfying life with that kind of bias. Um, that goes back oh. to basic instinct, right? You're in the woods and at night and you hear something, you know, creaking or some noise off and then, you know, it coming towards you. You don't assume that it's a friendly thing, yeah. person, animal, That's whatever. The negative information, you take right. precautions. Most of us would assume, and you should assume probably, that it could be something that's going to do you some harm right. and try to get away from it, right? Otherwise, so it's, uh, you know, we are sort of, I, I assume, instinctively wired to always be wary um, in uncertain, during uncertain circumstances like that, right? So- yeah. You're hardwired to be sensitive to that negative information. Yeah, right? yeah. And you have to just recognize it. That's part of that awareness aspect. So that optimism bias is key. Outcome bias is another one, as I, I mentioned. Uh, the illusion of control bias. We tend to think we have much more control um, than we actually do in situations. That kind of combines with what we call the narrative fallacy. If, you're, if your story looks like this or sounds like this, there's no way we can fail because we did we planned it together and we built the team together. That's a trigger to say, uh oh, you're missing something. That's and you're you're creating a story that's not realistic. Could be optimistic, but it's not right. realistically optimistic, right? right. So realistic optimism is is the thing that you're aiming for there. Uh, the other one is you know a big bias that holds us back is uh, categories. Two things go hand in hand: categories and boundaries. Um, we have a tendency, all of us, to put things in nice, neat categories, and then we'll draw a line around that. That's a boundary. And if you don't look or act or think like that thing inside that boundary, you don't get in. So what that does is creates us and them groups. Uh, and when it gets into sense making, then uh, if the thems are out there saying something like, hey, I think these helicopters might crash. Uh, you don't you want anything to do with them. You won't even listen to them. There's nothing they can say that will make you change your mind. So being aware of that, this is politics right now, right? This is the, the world of, uh, of hardcore, liberal, hardcore conservative, right? We, you know, the virtue is in the middle ground, right? Recognize uh, that if you want your language and your actions to be cooperative, you got to do away with some of those categories, right? The, the world isn't black and white, it's wholly gray. And that Categorization and boundary drawing keeps us from, uh, in the early sense-making phase, from considering things, or in the exploratory phase, from considering ideas that are different from ours. Right? Yeah. Holds us back. And it's be that's become more and more of a, an issue, obviously, uh, especially with social media and um, and our news. I mentioned our news feeds, right? I mean, we've all we're all we all start off with an opinion and it probably leans one way or another. And I'm not just talking political, right? It just leans one way or another. It can be political, it can just be worldview. It can be a whole bunch of different things. It could be religious. It could be just cultural. There's a, a whole lot of ways that we can have a whole lot of things that make up our, our, our view of the world. And, but, but now what happens Right, is that we have this this news feed, or we have or we have our news program, you know, our news uh, channels that we uh, decide to watch, right? Our networks that we watch, and they they they're pushing us further and further to an extreme. It seems like, um, and, and again with social media, it's so fascinating because you know that it's social media sees what you're interested in and starts to again feed things to you that they know are going to reinforce even more of those, those leanings. And then those leanings become more extreme. And it seems like we're, we're having a hard time meeting in the middle. We're seeing the gray, right? Everything is starting to become so black and white. And uh, how do you overcome that? So first of all, if, you know, for the most part, that's fine. You can get your shot of dopamine by listening to your favorite television personality, spouse, yeah. something that you want to hear, right? <clears throat> 
That's a confirmation bias. But when it comes to that decision-making in an uncertain environment, whether it's your business, your family, or something like that, here's that level of awareness, right? Where we're making sense of this to invite those diverse viewpoints in, right? It's gonna, there's gonna be conflicted, right? That's diversity drives um, diversity in all of its forms. So educational diversity, not just racial and gender, that's important as well, but educational diversity, uh, cultural diversity, all those things tend to, you know, generational diversity, all those things tend to lend themselves towards uh, cognitive diversity. We see the world a little bit differently. If we can integrate those things, we're going to come up with, generally with more powerful solutions than we would on our own. I go back to the Bin Laden raid. At one point, uh, we had a kid that you know grew up in, in a trailer trailer court, in a trailer park, I think in Texas, uh, had a high school diploma, debating with a guy that went to one of our more prestigious universities about how to execute a particular aspect of the mission. I ask people all the time, who do you think won, right? Most people go to the irony and say, the kid from Texas won. Um, but the fact of the matter is that neither of them won because they're flexible, right? They're not seeing the world in black and white. They both recognize that each had a point. They integrated those points of view to come up with something far more powerful. And again, during that sense-making phase, this becomes key. Now, each of those guys could have gone to their separate corners at the end of the day to read or watch their favorite television personalities or their social media and get that blast of, uh, <laughs> of, of biased information. And right. that's fun. Uh, oh, that's that's fine and dandy. It's when it it impacts our decision making uh, and our ability to cooperate, then it's not fine. Right? So one of the things that hopefully those our viewers can take away from this is that, that a key component to decision making in uncertain times is being open to other points of view, right? Not digging your heels in the sand and saying, you know, that person is not only are they wrong, but because they're wrong, they are my enemy, right? That, that they, they have a point of view, I should consider it, um, maybe try to see why they have that point of view. And, and you know, chances are they're not 100% wrong any more than I'm 100% right, I think is, is a lot of the thing. And I think we've, um, again, we've seen that become an issue of, of late in, in the world we live in. Yeah, I mean, it's, you, got, you have to see where you can integrate aspects, right? Um, and there are rare exceptions to that. If, you know, if you're working on an assembly line or something like that, very linear, the same thing happens day after day after day after day after day, and you've got 20 years of experience and making a lot of decisions in that environment, you can say my way or the highway, right? I've been here before, I know what's gonna happen. But in that uncertain world, uh, which these uncertainties come about through our interactions, right? As we interact in the world, we create these uncertainties. Uh, and it's really difficult to understand the impact of an action uh, an in, and the impact an action might have long term, right? And that's why the need to be flexible and adjust is also important as well, not get tied into uh, one particular pathway, right? Come together then during that sense making phase, explore your options, get out there and do those experiments. Again, that's that's the high stress part right there, but be open to that feedback, right? And, and if that feedback suggests that, hey, we need to think about changing our course of action, then do it. And again, then you, then you go right back to the process again. You get the feedback, how we make sense of that feedback. Okay, what are our options now? Okay, let's try another experiment. And ultimately you keep repeating these things over and over and over. And so we say in a, you know, in an, in an uncertain world, there are no elegant solutions. You know, the best sometimes we can hope for is to muddle well. I tell people, you know, put that on your t-shirt, muddle excellently. Um, you know, and that's something you have to be comfortable with, right? Yeah, it's interesting. You've told me also that um, as a SEAL, you had several, I can't remember how many of them were, three or four, uh, just certainties, certain, certain rules that always yeah. had to be followed, right? So even as we are trying to receive outside stimuli and make decisions and we have to consider others' points of view, there are certain rules that are absolute. It might, maybe you could tell us what those, uh, I remember one of them was never, you always had to have cover, right? I mean, that was that was one of them that I remember from what you told me. I, what, what, what are all the various, and I'm probably saying it wrong. But, no, no, yeah, I mean, so in any, in, in any group, right, uh, that, that performs a task, we would want to try and find what are those what are those rules that are absolutely essential, and that's hard to do. Um, just thinking about it, that was a great exercise, right? We've done this with your team. Uh -huh. uh, 
But, you know, for us, we've been at this for decades. We know what those rules are. Warriors have been around for eons. Um, and those three simple rules that we try not to break, try not to break uh, when we go into combat are, are quite simple. One is don't bunch up. So if we can conceive of a danger zone, we don't put all of our people in it at once. In, in general terms, that's an argument for diversity. In this case, we're, we diversify our location, but if you're a stockbroker, you diversify your portfolio. So that's an argument for diversity. Don't bunch up. The other was you mentioned cover is we know we're vulnerable on the move. So we don't move without somebody being stationary and covering for us. We say don't cross open spaces without somebody being uh, covering your back. Right. Uh, so, again, that's an argument for the, the need for support and stuff like that. Uh, but it's also an argument for contingency planning, for anticipating that things will go wrong, right? And when they do go wrong, what are you going to do about it, right? So we're back to consider uh, that exploratory phase, right? Is it possible that we might fail on, on the move? Yes, we have somebody covering for us that can help us out. And the third rule is we may contact with the enemy with the smallest element possible. So every time we made contact with you know, a group of Al-Qaeda militants, let's say there were eight guys in the team, we didn't send all eight guys up to make contact. Every contact was an experiment. You have no idea what's going to happen. They might throw up their hands or they launch the mother of all firefights, right? So four guys would approach to make that initial contact with four guys hanging back. And those four guys then can maneuver, take advantage of opportunities and stuff like that. And so those three simple rules, don't bunch up, don't cross open areas without uh, someone covering for you and make contact with the smallest element possible are things that, we, that helped us, actions we took that helped us manage uncertainty, right? Did not guarantee that we would manage uncertainty, right? And at times we broke those rules. Every time you get on a helicopter, you're bunching up, right? But we do that for a reason, uh, not out of ignorance of, the, of, those, of those vital rules. So again, a good point. When it comes to experimenting, those are things we would like to have in place, right? That can help us manage some of the uncertainty, right? So your standard operating procedures and stuff like that could help you do that. We want to consistently or continually challenge the, the relevance of such standard operating procedures, right? The world changes, our standard, op standard operating procedures might have to change as well. So. so after we've made a decision, right? Whether it's a good decision or a bad decision. So after we've made, whether it's a business decision, um, after a mission, after we've made a decision within our own family, uh, after we've decided what we're having for dinner, right? Let's talk about the post-decision process. Because again, we like you like to talk about processes a lot. I know that. And clearly there needs to be a breakdown or a discussion, you know, obviously not for dinner. I'm joking, right? I mean, maybe, maybe sometimes if somebody got sick, but, but, um, but for the most part, uh, you know, in a business environment, in a, in a military environment, and just, you know, in our own lives, you have to assess, right. And then use that to help you be better educated going forward. Maybe you could talk about how, how did you, how did you do that in the military? How do you recommend that, um, businesses and individuals do that in, in, in the regular world. Yeah. So again, this brings in you know, the feedback piece. If you make dinner and the kids throw up, that's good feedback, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, that lets you know that, Hey, your, your experiment didn't work out as you had planned. So right. you, you, can other other get, <laughs> you can never get past the feedback piece, right? One of the first things, particularly in an uncertain environment, um, even if you know you go to your local microbrewery and you agonize over you know which of the 150 beers to buy, right? This is the exploratory phase. Is it possible that this decision will not matter tomorrow? It is, right? If you won't remember it tomorrow, which beer you had or next year, unless you had too many, right? So you just make that decision, right? There's there's nothing to that. There's no impact, long-term impact. Make the decision, right? Now, if you if you drink too many, there's the feedback. Made a bad decision. Or you make a decision and, and you don't get any feedback. The first feedback you get is from you. And that's buyer's remorse, right? What happens quite a bit. Uh, just recognize that. You make a decision. Ah, I should have chosen the other beer. That's buyer's remorse. Let it go. Wait for the real feedback, right? Uh, and then you'll adjust off of that. But let's say decision's done, project's over with. Uh, then there are ways to assess the, the after action review is something that we lived by. And, you know, in the military, you, you got to have some kind of, you know, draconian sounding name after action review. It's really just a debrief. 
But here again, flexibility is involved because can you talk about the mistakes that you made? And that's what we really do well, right? We get, you know, what was planned, what actually happened, right? So we have to talk about those. What went well, what didn't go so well? What did we learn, right? If you're gonna label yourself as anything and your kids as anything, label them as learners, right? And that's the most important to us. Not just the outcome, we got Bin Laden, but what did we learn from that? That's also uh, a goal. So uh, what do we learn and what will we do differently next time? And we go through that process over and over and over again. The, the downside of that is when that process becomes so routine that you're just glossing over it, now you're going to miss the things that you really need to pay attention to. And I've seen that happen, right? Uh, even, even to guys like me, you know, uh, where we, we just, you know, we run out of energy, we gloss through that after action review process or that debrief process, it's vital, right? What was planned? What actually happened? What went well? What didn't go so well? What did we learn and what will we do differently next time? And that next time might be the next mission. And, and this is, we're right back into the decision-making phase again. Here's what we learned on the last one. We're gonna try that on this one, right? But we're still gonna be open to feedback because we know it's not going to be an elegant solution. Right. It's going to be a little bit clumsy. We're going to make mistakes. Every context is a little bit different. We have to keep all those things in mind. And ultimately, what happens is you start to become uh, uh, comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. You get comfortable being in uncertain situations. You get comfortable uh, with ambiguity. And some would tell you, hey, that's where wisdom lives. Right. That comfort with ambiguity. I also think we have to get comfortable with our own decision-making process. We, so at our company at, at Rosenberg and Parker, we make everybody take what's called a Colby test. And I don't, I think you and I have talked about yeah. that K-O-L-B-E and yeah. I'll give them a little plug because I think their test is spectacular and, and, and it rates you on four different areas and basically tells you, tells, tells us, tells the, the person looking at the test, how an individual takes action and everybody's different. And, and, um, and so for example, I'm a quick start is what is how it, you know, how they, one of the things that, that, uh, that came out of that, which means that in terms of making a decision, and then there's other people on the other side who are researchers. That's the other, that's sort of the opposite of the quick start is the researcher, right? So I think about like when you're going to go to, to, you know, out to, you know, pick an electronic store and you're going to buy a new TV, right? Right. Some people will agonize over the process, right? They'll take months to do it. They'll read all the consumer reports. They'll go online and read every review on every site and to try to determine which TV they want to purchase. And then there's somebody like me who goes to the store or maybe now goes online and says, all right, which one's on sale, <laughs> right? Which is the best deal? Um, I, which one meets the size needs and, and all the other things? And then in about 10 minutes, I'm like, all right, wrap it up, put it in the car. I want, I'm going to get on out of here. And What's interesting about that is that neither one is right or wrong. And the studies have shown that neither one, none of us are going to necessarily be happier than the other with our decision. Um, the, the, the quick start like me can't imagine spending all that time going through all that research and, you know, and, um, and fact checking to make that decision. And of course the researcher can't imagine doing that. What I do would give that person a, an anxiety attack, right? To, do with that without. But at the end of the day, we can both be just as happy or just as unhappy with our with our purchase, right? Or with our decision. So um so you're, you're what you're talking about there is that that uh, exploratory phase, you know, and you're yeah. unconsciously asking yourselves the impact of that decision. And yeah. for you know, and for some, you know, oh, I'm just gonna go out and buy the TV and I don't, you know, I, I really don't care how it's gonna impact me a year from now. Other people are more inclined to, to say to themselves, this is an impactful decision. I really need to think about it. And, and that's fine, right? And, but you're still, what I'm suggesting then is through this process of making sense, exploring, experimenting, and then uh, adjusting is that you become more aware of that. And that level of awareness, like I said at the, at the outset, is what's going to help you become a better, not perfect, but a better decision maker uh, in uncertain environments. And speaking of better, that's, the, that's what we use as our guide. Uh, is our situation better or worse, uh, as opposed to, you know, to trying to often technically measure something? If we, we have so many of those, you know, key performance indicators and stuff like that, sometimes that measure is, 
am I better or is the team better or is the company better or is the family better off uh, or are we worse off? And if we're worse off, well, we got to make some adjustments. If we're better off, are there still adjustments that we can make given the feedback that we're getting? But you're still going through that process, right? When you're weighing the impact of that TV. Yeah. yeah. Raise I, I the awareness. There's such a thing as decision-making fatigue, right? It's because decision-making takes such energy and especially in, in uncertain times when it feels like you're having to make more decisions and even more impactful decisions. Um, yeah, we're back, to Steve. Must, we're back to the judges. What's that? We're back to Steve Jobs and we're back to the judges. You know, right. Steve Jobs recognized, hey, I can spend energy, you know, deciding what to wear in the morning or I can just put the same thing on. Uh, and use that energy you know, to the toward right. put it toward the things that matter. Our right. judge, who by the end of the day, decision fatigue means we're just making black and white yes right. or no kinds of things, Absolutely. leads to a lot of stress too, which ultimately starts to break us down, which ultimately impacts our ability to make good decisions, which leads to more decision fatigue, which you can get into a really negative spiral there, which leads to burnout and stuff like that, or or worse. Obviously, there are there are diagnosable conditions that can come from stuff like that, right? Awareness of that, back to that awareness thing again, allows us to sidestep some of those issues, right? And even better if we link arms and we do it together, bottom, bottom line. We're better sense makers together. It's a team sport. Well, that's it. Well, so that's kind of a good, uh, so I think we're, we're coming near the end of this discussion. This has been fascinating. And, and so maybe you're right, we're better together. I think that's a good, um, thought to, to sort of, as, as we get near the end, do you have any other sort of final thoughts and uh, for our, everybody watching in terms of, you know, just again, we're, what to do in terms of decision-making and any final um, feedback that they should consider as we, uh, as we move on and, um, and, and get back to things? Yeah, just that, you know, decision making, we, we tend to put it in the realm of formal leadership. But again, each and every one of us makes anywhere from hundreds to thousands of decisions a day. And if you let purpose be your guide rather than status, uh, you're more apt to make decisions that will affect the group positively, as opposed to just affecting yourself positively, which, you know, ultimately is what I, I aim to create, not just in my own life, but with my my clients as well, right? Let's let's have purpose as our guide uh, and start making decisions that, uh, that you know create positive change around us, around our companies, around our families, around our organizations, etc. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Dave. This is as always when when we get together. This has been fascinating. This has been a lot of fun. We have been talking about decision making, and uh, at Rosenberg and Parker, we have made the decision that we would like to have uh, an impact during RIMS this year on the, 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 the world at large and on our communities. And, and one of the, an issue that continues to be at the forefront throughout the world for many, many people is the lack of uh, safe sanitation and specifically safe drinking water. I think that was brought to light even here at home in the United States after the, the recent uh, ice storms in Texas where so many people who had burst pipes and there was contamination and all sorts of things uh, did not have drinking water. And of course, around the world, we see this as a major issue where uh, there are many, many countries where people struggle day to day with just getting clean drinking water. And in many cases have to hike miles and miles for that. So at Rosenberg and Parker, we have decided uh, to make a generous donation to the Red Cross and also to Rotary, which is an organization I've been involved with for, for many, many years um, that, that has safe drinking water as one of its main um, main projects. So uh, we're going to do that this year. We'd like to make a donation in your name uh, as a thank you for, uh, for spending time with us today. So, and we'd invite uh, anybody out there who'd like to make a donation as well to please do so. And you can uh, see uh, the, the links that we'll provide to be able to do that. So uh, thank you again, Dave. And um, hopefully, you know, we can make a small difference out there. I'm honored. That, that's cool stuff. I have a group of uh, alumni from Oxford and HEC Paris who do the, the Water is Life project. So something near and dear to, to my heart. I'm glad to see it's near and dear to yours as well and to, you know, to billions of people. So cool. Great. Like Thank I said, you. I'm honored.